Good morning. Good morning. Um, so my name is Joshua. I work at the college, and um, I do a few things there. I, I teach. I also um, I work in retention. So my job is to make sure you guys finish your classes and eventually walk on stage and graduate and move on. So we do, um, you know, we, we do several things in regards to actually trying to retain you guys. You know, uh, and part of it is bringing role models, bringing speakers. As you guys see, um, we brought Ernesto Quinones, Richard Blanco. Um, Juno Diaz a few years ago, and today we'll see um, Raquel Cepeda. So I was on Facebook, uh, and our parents call you know Facebook, and um, so I run into uh, I run into Nas's uh, Facebook page. Um, Nas is the rapper, um, and then I see this this young woman there, and um, she looks Dominican. I mean we know Dominicans will receive one, right? So she looks Dominican, and I Google her, and I run into this book, and. Exactly what we do at the center is working on identifying ourselves as potential leaders in the community. You know, understanding that, you know, whatever we read in the newspaper, whatever they, they tell us who we are, is usually not true. Um, and I guess Apeda is actually working with a lot of rappers, a lot of artists, and trying to figure their identity as well. Um, so obviously, this is an expansion of our job. Um, that was after hours, you know, there's many, many of us teachers, educators, tutors, administrators who work after hours to make sure that you guys get the best product that we could pro possibly provide. Uh, we don't have a lot of money, so we need to think creatively about this stuff. Um, so my challenge to you while Raquel speaks is to um, meet us halfway because we're doing our side of a job. We're bringing people, we're, um, we're sitting down with students, we're doing our part. So my challenge to you guys today is to connect with the story, connect with Raquel, uh, connect with your family, um, because I'm telling you guys, in psychology, all that stuff, um, at the end of the day, if you don't like who you see in the mirror, it's kind of tough to kind of get through college and finish off. Um, a little bit about Raquel. Um, she was born and raised in, um, in Harlem, lived in DR for a little bit. She's, um, she started as a hip-hop journalist, so she was... She was at the beginning of the hip hop movement. So hip hop obviously started when um, in New York, when kind of like the, the crack epidemic and all that stuff and poverty was really hitting New York. So she started in the beginning of the hip hop. Um, she did that for about, what, I mean, her whole life, 20, 30 years. Um, and then she moved on into um, film, filmmaking. And in 07, she, she dropped a, a, a film, a documentary called Bling, Planet Rock, which brought Tego Calderon, Paul Wall, and give me one more and Ray Kwan from the Wu-Tang Clan, which is the most popular one, right? Um, it brought her to um, Sierra Leone. Um, so you got these rappers talking about diamonds and golds and all that stuff, but I can actually expose them to, to the African struggle of what actually is the product of the diamonds that they rap about. So it was eye-opening. I actually use it in my class, and I, I'm going to continue to use some of her stuff in my class as well. Um, so she's, like I said, hip-hop journalist. She's interviewed... Oh, I mean, all the big names. Um, she's been in CNN.com, The Village Voice, People Magazine, The New York Times, and obviously the most recent is Bird of Paradise, uh, How I Became Latina, uh, which kind of tracks, I mean, she'll talk about it, which kind of tracks her, her, um, her childhood and how it led into her identity crisis and how she kind of came back and with the use of DNA specialists and, and scientists kind of tracked down her ancestors in Africa, um, the region of where they came from. So, um, you know, you guys came in to, to speak with her. So my challenge to you guys is to connect with the story, all right? So no further ado, um, Raquel Cepeda. So uh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited, and actually I feel privileged to be able to have, like, young people to talk to. It's not every day that, you know, folks like me get to talk to a group of high school and some, I hear some eighth graders. Um, you know, we usually talking to, like, you know, old people and academics and using like long words to try to lose each other. But today is all about connecting and talking to you. And, um, and it's really in my interest to do that because you're my future. And if you guys don't succeed, then I'm effed up when I get older. So I challenge you, okay, to listen and to have questions and to, um, you know, and to do you. Okay, so, but before I start, I wanted just to say thank you to uh, the White Fund trustees, to Northern Essex Community College, to Lawrence High School, to Martha Levitt, to uh, Mr. Richard Gorham, and uh, to Joshua Abreu for that wonderful introduction. I'm not that old. I haven't been writing for 30 years. <laughs> I know Dominican don't crack, 
but I am not that old. I've been writing for 20 years, okay? Coño, you ain't putting me in the, in the ground before it's my time. So uh, I wrote some things down because I have such a short time with you and I'm so excited and I, and I can go on and on for hours and hours, but I want to hear from you. And um, I know we're working with a time frame here, so I wrote a couple of notes down. So um, as an adult, it's my, not, a, not an old adult, but a young adult, um, it's my privilege and honor to be able to share this time, however briefly, to give you the tools you need for a successful life. I'm not talking about a life of material riches and money and bling and all that. I'm not here to tell you to chase after the so-called American dream. I'm not here to sell you that BS. I'm saying if the American dream means that you sell your own soul out in order to completely assimilate, meaning to have to give up who you are to fit into what the perception of American mainstream society is, um, then destroy that. Debunk it, recreate and recreate it so that you can create an identity that, identity that works for you, okay? I'm telling you, as a younger generation, the folks who my future depends on, what I've learned is the key to realizing your true potential as leaders worth following. I was thinking about what my older self, a mom of a high school senior and an almost two-year-old son, and somebody who has taken an alternative professional route to what many in my own community have done. I write, I um, started as a hip hop journalist and uh, started writing about other things, about cultural criticism, about my own community, about being Dominican American, about not being American enough or Dominican enough to fit anywhere, about having to reconcile um, that issue, about the things that I don't like, because you know how it is if you're Dominican American, which many I think of you guys are here, we have a love-hate relationship with our parents' homeland. Right now, I hate it, but we'll get into that later. But you know, it's like a struggle, right? Every, like, it's every few years you feel like, wow, man, where do you fit in? And um, that's one of the reasons why I uh, decided to explore identity through writing and through film, and most recently, like Joshua said, through my book, Bird of Paradise, How I Became Latina. Um, people ask me, like, where did you get that name, why? Well, I don't know, how many of you are Dominican? How many of you are from La Capital? How many of you know Paraíso? Okay, so I'm from Paraíso. My family's from Paraíso, and um, that's where Bird of Paradise, uh, that part of the title came. Um, I came from, I was born in Harlem, and then, you know, like a lot of Dominican-American youth, I was raised by my mother's side of the family and shipped over to Santo Domingo, and I went back and forth until eventually I came back home to New York City and then became a full-fledged Dominiorcian. I don't know what that is here, but that's, it is what it is. And um, when I moved back, I moved back to live with my father. I was one of the few people that I knew who was raised by my father and my stepmother. And everybody in Santo Domingo said, well, you know, when he came to, to pick me up, well, he must have made it because he married a white woman. So that means he's rich. He got a lot of things going on and he's better. So when I came back to live in, you know, when I left my grandparents who were very kind and, and wonderful people and my family, my mother's family, to move to New York, all of a sudden I was told by my father as an eight-year-old, you know, you tell people you're American. You know, he would go around telling people he was a white American, uh, more specifically a Jewish American, because for him, being Jewish meant being white. And I said, well, how do, why, I was an eight-year-old, well, why, why, are we, why are we white and Jewish? Because I have a yamaka. And that's what it means, you know, have a beanie. So I was like, that's what makes you, whatever you do, do not tell people that you're a Dominican. So obviously, you know, when you hear, when you see these uh, expressions of self-hatred in your parents, what do you do? You become disenfranchised and then you start to have your own identity crisis. And because I was growing up in the early 80s in, um, in New York, I was blessed enough to be around a burgeoning, a spawning hip hop culture. And in hip hop, in the beginning, it wasn't like what you see now, where it's just rap music and it's just about like one or two themes. It was, it was a very holistic culture. It was about you know, graffiti expression, you know, um, aerosol art. It was about dancing. It was about technology through you know, DJing. It was about fashion. It was about expression. Before it made money, we were just using hip hop in order to be able to talk to each other. So whether you were white or black or purple or whatever, or Mexicano or Dominican or whatever, we were using that as a kind of a meeting ground. 
And I've been really blessed to be able to um, use hip hop as a vehicle to, that led me here to this very moment to be with you. So, you know, I guess everything happens for a reason. And because of my own father and other of my friends, you know, their parents had, some of them had this issue with not wanting to, wanting to shed their Latino-ness. It made me very, very, um, it made me more interested in, 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 in finding out the reasons why. And why is it that so many people in communities of color have this self-hatred? Um, and that eventually led to the writing of this book, which I hope some of you have a chance, get a chance to read. Um, so I was thinking, what would my older self uh, tell my younger self? What advice would I give my younger self uh, if, that if that kind of time travel were possible in order to succeed? And I came up with a few points that I wanted to share with you guys. One would be, my older self would tell my younger self, move every single day. A body that, that stops moving becomes static, and when you don't move, you become sluggish, you become lethargic, and that eventually leads to a still mind. And a, mind, a body and a mind that stops, stops, and, you know, stops working starts to, it, it feels worse than it even sounds. And a lot of times, especially when it comes to women, we stop moving, we stop thinking, and we start looking outward for validation and for somebody to tell us that we're beautiful and, and, you know, and we're worth it. And you know, that leads to premature sex, which leads to teen pregnancy, and we all know, you know what that leads to, a cycle of poverty, right? So move every single day, even if it's to stretch. Just get your minds moving. Learn about your history. You are the embodiment, especially as Caribbean Latinos, as Dominican Americans, you are the embodiment of what it means to be American. You may find out that, yeah, that if you did this uh, research, that you are the embodiment of the new world. And I'll give you one example. You know, when I was growing up in New York City, people said, you know, you don't belong here. You hear the same thing. Nothing changes, right? You don't belong here. You're not American enough. You know, you learn that the, that the people that founded New York City um, were, you know, from, that we were Dutch. Christian Hendrickson is, is the founder of New York. And as I started doing research and research, I came across a name in the name of uh, one Yang Rodriguez. And I'm like, What's a, that's a weird name. He stood out. And they called him the Black Spaniard or the Black Rascal. And he was Christian Hendrickson's um, translator with, with the Lenape. So he had already been there, right? Because he had to learn the language. And I was like, where does this guy come from? And his race was a, was, a, was a point of contention. People were always arguing about it. He wasn't white enough to fit in. He wasn't, you know, he was the first free person of color to live in, in uh, New York City 13 years before slaves arrived, African slaves arrived to the city. And his very existence bothered people. So I said, I wonder where this guy's from. So I found out that his real name was Juan Rodriguez, and he was born in Santo Domingo. So I'm like, wait a minute. So this other guy gets the props for finding New York, but it was really somebody who actually settled the way that I think people should settle. He came in, he learned the culture, he married into the Lenape, and he didn't have to kill anybody, commit genocide, or promote self-hatred to do that. So I was very proud, actually. It made me even more proud to be um, Dominican when I saw how this person settled into New York City. So if you imagine all the things you can find out, you can unearth, if you were just to scratch the surface, right? Okay. Don't think that, um, that becoming American means you have to completely turn your back on where you came from. The, the long word for that, the college word, is called selectively acculturating. And I'm gonna, t I'm gonna break down what that means. So that means take what you like from your parents' homeland, from, your, from, the, old, from the old world, take what you like, what works for you, for works for you here in America, and make those things come together, okay? Don't feel like you have to change your name, which many, you know, when I moved away and I came back to live in my neighborhood, I found that, you know, some of the people that I went to grammar school with and high school with gave themselves American names, and um, you know, wear contacts, blue contacts, and there's nothing wrong with like, you know, changing your look every once in a while, but you know, it's the reasons why they're doing this, right? They're trying very hard to speak without an accent, to become the ideal of what they think is, is to be American. But you'll find that many of these people, while they may have money, they may be paid, um, they may have successes in the material world, are miserable inside. And who wants to live like that? Observe something positive about yourself every single day. 
every single day, whether you're staring at an F or you're in detention or you got screened at by your mother or you didn't do your laundry, your chores, whatever, just look in the mirror and just say one positive thing about yourself. You'd be surprised how this will change your outlook and your approach on everything, on the way you, the, the way you approach life, the way you approach everything. We all have bad days, right? So at the end of, of the, you know, at the bottom of the world, of the world, of the well, excuse me, in el fondo, we have to know that we're good people, that we're worth, we're worthy of success, and that this too is part of our land and we, you know, should be able to be free to express ourselves the way we want. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Um, learn how to like yourself. I always hear speakers talk about mobilizing, starting new political parties, running for office, becoming teachers, becoming lawyers, becoming doctors, et cetera, et cetera. But how can you do anything without liking what you see in the mirror? How can you want to move and mobilize for your people if you don't like what you see? How can you like what you see in other people's faces, right? So in order for you to be able to, to, to um, start a revolution, whatever that means to you, you have to start with the self. We have to learn how to like ourselves. Despite what our parents tell us, if your parents tell you, ay, pero mira ese pajón, straighten it, do this, do that. Don't feel the pressure. You know, they, they, they bring in that old school, you know, crap from the old world to here. You know, educate them. Use that as an opportunity. Use that negativity as an as a, as a, um, opportunity to bridge the gap and to talk about things that matter. Don't shy away from talking about race and identity, you know, with your, with your parents, with your teachers, and with your peers. And you'll find, too, that if you stop straightening your hair, your skin will get better, you'll you start shining, you'll start glowing, and that it's very beautiful, actually. <laughs> okay. When uh, you really start digging what you see in the mirror and around you, you will find another way to articulate yourself, to express yourselves other than, than using violence or going into a life of crime. Trust me, as a former you know, borderline delinquent, I've been there. You know, I used to, f the only way that I was able to express my anger and my frustration was by fighting, you know, getting into a lot of trouble, uh, being, you know, asked very politely, I would say, to leave schools. I've been in having to go to, like, several schools. And I was very, 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 very um, violent. I approached everything with violence because I didn't know how to speak, how to articulate myself. Um, you have to start liking what you see in the mirror. Because when you do, you'll find, you'll find yourself not wanting to, to, to be violent against other people or yourselves, okay? This one is very important. Don't buy everything you read and learn, especially not in school, okay? This is true. I mean, we, as a communities of color and Latino Americans, we are often miseducated in this country, and in our society, even in the old, in the, you know, in the old school. If many of you went to uh, school in DR for a couple of years or whatever, uh, you'll find that the same things happen there. It happens everywhere. Um, be critical thinkers. Ask questions when something doesn't sound right. Just ask questions. De de uh, debate and develop your brain power. And by developing your brain power, you develop your vocabulary. The other thing is. Don't worry about the check boxes. Regardless of what society dictates, identity is always shifting, and only you can do the work that it takes to define yourself. So don't worry about fitting into any check boxes. And the last thing I would say is learn how to be a gracious loser. A lot of my success comes from losing a lot, of being told no, being rejected. I get rejected almost on the daily. As a writer, as a filmmaker, you know, you fill out. I do some, like really boring things every day, like fill out grants that are very boring, they're not creative, asking people for money, asking people to you know, support my crazy ideas, my ideas to educate people of communities of color, and I get turned down most, maybe twice or three times a week. And only by learning really how to, how to lose gracefully will you, you know, be able to become a better, gracious, more, you know, a gr more gracious winner. So I would say don't be dejected when something doesn't go your way, all right? We are strong people, and 
it's not going to get easier when you leave high school. It's actually going to get a lot harder. So I would, I would invest the time into identifying yourselves and getting to know yourselves while you're here and you have the comfort of living at home before going out in the real world. Because uh, the only American dream is the one that you invent for yourself. So with that said, I want to be able to open it up and talk to you guys and, and you know, hear some feedback and, and see how you're doing this morning. It has to be one question. Oh, did I piss anybody off with anything I said? Come on, man. Like, you know, let's, let's spar. <laughs> yes, kind sir. Okay, out of 10 times, I would say I get like two or three successes, but those ones are really good. <laughs> and they help me, and they help me, you know, they help me. Like, for example, when I was selling this book, when I was trying to sell my book, they were like, it's the first memoir by a Dominican-American author. We are known for novels. You know, we have amazing writers like Nelly Rosario and Juno Diaz. I mean, we have, you know, Julia Alvarez. We have great novelists. But no, you know, there was nobody writing memoirs. So I couldn't really find myself. Well, I love books, you know, that I read by Esmeralda Santiago, et cetera, et cetera. I couldn't find myself exactly my story in a book. So when I... Um, pitched it, and I wrote a long proposal, and I did all that boring, grown-up work of getting it out there, I got rejected maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 times before somebody said yes, because nobody thought that it was important to, um, to document what we're, what we're going through in this country, in this society. So you're always fighting, you're always, you know, going against the, the grain, going against the norm. And when you do that, you have to learn how to deal with rejection. Never, ever, 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 ever. The harder things get, the more I, I dig doing them. <laughs> yes, sir. Bird of Paradise, How I Became Latina. So it's broken up in two parts. The first part is about growing up in Washington Heights, much like you guys did here. There are parts about where I came to Lawrence a few times, and um, you'll read about that as well. Lawrence back then was very different from Lawrence today. And the second part is basically a genetic adventure that I went on um, by testing myself and five other family members. Have you ever heard of ancestral DNA testing? You know, where they, where they like, you see it on, on like a PBS, where they take your, um, your DNA and they find out like where you come from. It was very interesting what I found out. What I found out basically is that I'm the physical embodiment of globalization, just my own self walking around. And with that, with, when I got those results, I felt so empowered that it made me even more um, amped to tell my story and get my work out there. And, 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 and like you said, you know, asking me if I ever wanted to give up, knowing what you walk with makes you feel so empowered that you feel like you almost have like an army with you. I never walked around famous. I walked around infamous. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. As I grew older, how did I learn to deal with my dad's? Well, I couldn't wait to go to college just to get away. I was counting those days. I got lucky because I found a mother figure in my community that I ended up spending more time with because, like I said, I grew up with my dad and not with my, with my birth mother. Um, so I was able to kind of escape his craziness at that time. But actually, the more that he showed that he didn't want to be a certain thing, the more I wanted to be it. And the more vested I became in learning why people feel that way, like what's at the bottom. I'm always interested in what's inside and how we can change that. Yes. Well, it's definitely a little less invested because, you know, when I was growing up, hip hop was a lot more holistic. It was about dance. It was more of a cultural expression, right? And it still is that. It's just that you have to really search for it. And my interest, you know, hip hop speaks to young people. And while I'm young in my head, right? I'm not a teenager, so my daughter definitely puts me up on a lot, but I still like all, everybody that I liked when I was growing up. And I, you know, I'm still very, very um, vested in the culture. It's the thing that allowed me to do everything that I've done to, to this day. 
So for me, it's like, um, it defines who I am. It's like part of my, it's like part of my being. It's part of what's in my DNA and my blood and my ancestral memory. Yes. Oh, it was really a lot more economically depressed. Um, a, it was just what I've witnessed, you know, some violence, some, um, you know how it is in our communities, we deal with domestic violence, we don't like talking about it, like to keep our dirty laundry in the house. But being that I had family members here, I was able to see things firsthand that were pretty, you know, uh, horrific. And also just the area was like a lot more gangs and it was just a lot, you know, maybe because I'm from, I'm not from here, I'm from New York City. Maybe for me it was magnified, but it was certainly different. It was a different time. It looks that way. I've only been here for a day, but yeah, it looks that way. I mean, the fact that you guys are sitting here, you know, like when I was in high school and I had to go home to listen to people talk, after the first 10 minutes I was like, so the fact that you guys are engaged, most of you, and, and are, you know, and are up and are alert and are open, I mean, that to me already is a, is a change for the better. Yes. Yes. In my career, not necessarily, but except that, you know, I'm bilingual, um, the good thing is that we're born kind of knowing foreign policy. And a lot of Americans have never left like the East Coast or left where they're from or know of a world that exists outside of America. We are basically born with that, taking advantage of that actually, taking that for granted, that we already understand that there's a country outside of the United States, right? Because we have close ties, most of us, to, um, to, to the island. So um, I was able to really develop a curiosity about the world around me from a very young age because of that. The other thing, um, some of my work, leads me to different parts of the world and to travel. And the great thing about being Dominican is that I'm ambiguous and I basically fit in everywhere I go. So I really get to experience a country because if I go, like, for example, to Austria, they'll think I'm, a, I'm Turkish. If I go to Morocco, they think I'm from Morocco. If I go somewhere, so you kind of just blend in and you really get to see life um, for better and for worse through a very real angle. Well, I'm definitely, you know, I tell them to take a different approach with education. You know, when you're a woman and you're a Latina, whether you're Dominican or not, you know, different communities, Cuban, Puerto Rican, et cetera, you know, the old ideals is, you know, you can have children in high school, it's okay, you could be, you know, you're more domesticated. When boys have the freedom to do whatever they want, to be out, which actually here in this setting is not so good, um, you know, women are not as... They're not as doted over as men are um, in, in, the old, in the old country, you know what I mean? Um, they have to stay home, they gotta cook, they gotta sit. there's no time to really, they, gotta, they have obligations, family obligations, that makes it really difficult for them to stay on top of school. And actually, that manifested itself in an alarming statistic. Latina American teenagers have the highest suicide uh, rate and, su fan and um, suicide ideation rates in America meaning that they fantasize about killing themselves. Um, they have the largest you know, uh, demographic of people that are depressed because it's hard to reconcile all that stuff and to manage it. Yes. Um, well, I would say that I personally have never suffered an identity crisis, um, but I see I'm part of my community and, as, and, and I'm gonna say that if my community is suffering that, then I'm part of it. Um, and I would never change a day of my life, no. If it, you know, because everybody is, I believe in destiny, I believe in kismet, I believe in fate. Everybody has a certain, um, a certain, um, how do I say it without sounding new agey and, B and bs -y. <laughs> Everybody has their own path in life, you know what I mean? We just have to be able to be open enough to listen to when the universe is speaking. And for me, it was to go through what I had to go through to be here. To me, it was kind of embarrassing because, no, you know, he would tell people things like that. Nobody would believe him. Like, you know, I was able to get, like, these scholarships to swanky, for example, tennis camps, and he would tell people things, and people were like, yeah, okay, uh-huh, you know, like, 
It was, oh, it, it's, it's, and I saw it, and being able to see it from where I was, you know, this small child, right? It really had an impact on me. And actually, I feel sorry for him, but during the course of the book, I realized that there was a reason. There was a, there was a reason that he was that way. He was handling a trauma that happened to him when he was younger. So I, I th so the fact that we went on this, so we went on this genetic adventure, and I asked my dad to give me some of his DNA on the cotton in the Q-tip so that I can send it. And I said, Dad, you know, if you give me this, if you work with me on this, tu me puedes mortificar, because we could find out that you really are Jewish. And then I'll take you to the synagogue. I promise I'll find a way to, like, you know, I'll give you a new yarmulke. I'll do everything for you. Just give me some of your DNA. So he said, are you sure that you're not just trying to find out if I have other kids? And I said... I wouldn't do that to the other kids. I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't do that to them. I wouldn't put anybody through that pain. So he finally did, and I'll tell you one result. Um, so I was in the Dominican Republic, and I got an email with the results of his mtDNA, his mitochondrial DNA, his m direct maternal, la, la linea de su mamá, the direct maternal lineage. We knew that his mother was a recogida, right? So we didn't really know where, he was, where she was from. So um, we found out that he wasn't Jewish, but don't tell anybody. Um, what we found out was that he was Indian, and that I thought that was very revolutionary because, you know, our beloved country in the Dominican Republic, um, and I'm saying that sarcastically because I actually hate them right now, um, they made, it's interesting, more and more and more people are finding out that they have this indigenous blood, right? Um, people call it Taino. But in fact, there were many different kinds of indigenous people, but that Columbus, when he was discovered by them, decided to just call Taino, right? Um, so we found that out, that more and more, my father's just one example, but more and more people are coming out with you know, ancestral DNA that links them to the indigenous. So really, Columbus didn't um, destroy, disseminate the community in the first three decades of his um, of his colonial, you know, colonializing of the, of the island, many of them found ways to survive. And we're finding that in the cuevas and everything. We're finding that, you know, um, you know, old school graffiti, which is the petroglyphs, and evidence that people did find ways to survive. And it's interesting because with this fang now, with this uh, ancestral DNA thing that they're doing a lot of in Dominican Republic as well, the government made it illegal for you to call yourself to identify as an indígena. You can only, in your cedula, in your ID card, say that you're black, white, or mulatto. So it's interesting that even though we're finding that this part of our ancestry is in fact still existing in our bodies, the ruling class over there is still is oppressing us over there and not allowing us to, um, to, to mark that off on our cedulas, but it doesn't matter because it's still there. No matter how much you try to push a community down, they still find a way to manifest itself, themselves. So uh, that was empowering to find that out. And my father was like, pero eso no es posible, porque ellos se murieron. Toditos se murieron. And I'm like, no, they exist in you. Yes, sir. Well, one of the reasons why, you know, we have, as you, you know, and don't front like you guys don't have it either, is a love and hate relationship. You know how it is. You go there, you're proud. You go there, and all of a sudden, you know, you're not Dominican enough. I mean, you're not, yeah, you're not Dominican enough. You come here, you're not American enough. You're stuck in, like, this limbo, right? But the policies are the things that make me really, really angry. Um, just one example would be, um, their, you know, the new law to, to um, forcibly um, basically clean the country of ha people of Haitian descent, right? So you're going back to Dominicans from 1929 forward. Anybody that has a Haitian you know, descent has to go back to uh, Haiti. Some of them don't have any family members there. And they don't even know. They just, you know, you've been, if you've been Dominican for generations and generations, I don't want, you know, sometimes there's no connection to the, other, to the other side. So why are you forcing people to have to relocate? Um, that is morally bombing us back to a very dangerous time in our history. And that's just, you know, appalling. And I really wonder if the people in the ruling class were to do their own DNA testing and their own genealogical research, I'm sure we can find Haitians in their family too. And what are they going to do? Are they going to take themselves out of the Dominican Republic and move over to Haiti? It's just ridiculous. It's just not, it's immoral. So that's like one of the main reasons why I despise 
um, the Dominican Republic right now. I'm hoping to fall back in love with it, though, when they come to their senses. <laughs> yes. My violent phase, really, the more I learned about myself, the more, the less violent I felt, and the, and the more self-love I felt, actually. The more I learned to like myself, the more I learned to love and like the people that were around me. So I would say, you know, really learning about your history and about how important you are um, is the key to, 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 you know, leaving that way of life behind you. Thank you. Yes, sir. No, 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 no. Mainstream meaning to become the ideal of, mainstream, of being American, right? The mainstream dictates that in order for you to become American, you have to kind of, you know, leave that side of yourself, the Latino side, back, back there, back in wherever your people come from. Um, I'm sorry, you're having a moment. I guess you're famous. Yeah, um, so anyway, no, um, you know, what I'm saying is you don't have to be a certain way. You don't have to fit into a certain box. You don't have to, you know, um, like Sammy Sosa, lighten your skin. It just looks, he looks like a freaking walking dead. Um, you don't have to do those things because those things are symptomatic of something greater, right, of a bigger problem. If somebody's going to go through that, you know, lining their skin, conking their hair, um, you know, really trying to look the part of, of, of the ideal of beauty, right? Um, that only serves to destroy you inside. And who cares about becoming rich and becoming famous and becoming, you know, a leader if, you, if you're not right with yourself? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. <laughs> there you are. I actually, um, that's a great question, if I'm connected to my mother and my father. Um, well, my, my father and I have reconciled, and that's what part of the book is about. It's about how we found this very kind of fragile place of peace in our, um, in our relationship, which I think it's a, it's a working truth and reconciliation. And as far as my um, birth mother goes, I haven't seen her since I interviewed her for the book. So um, some people, you know, you have to, I, I honor I honor her for, you know, for, for birthing me and for allowing me to be here and to live my um, destiny. But some people are just not close that way, and you have to protect yourself and your own children and your own family. And if it means to cut yourself off from, from people that um, are related to you, that's what, it, you know, that's what you have to do. Life is messy. You're going to learn that. What hip hop albums? Oh, um, I would say it takes a nation by Public Enemy. Um, anything really by KRS One. Um, Nas is Illmatic remains one of my favorite. Um, Wu Tang Clan's Thirty Six Chambers and To the Wu, pretty amazing. As you see, I'm very partial to the East Coast hip hop. That's why I don't like answering that question because I sound like I'm divided, like I'm in a gang, you know. Um, but a lot of, like, um, I really love the early stuff. Like, you know, um, oh, actually, anything from the Native Tongues, um, De La Soul, Tribe Called Quest, um, Jungle Brothers. Um, I like some of what the Beat Nuts did. Um, I love Moni Love. Um, you know, like that era. I like the golden era of hip hop, the stuff that's from, like, uh, the late mid 80s to the early 90s. A lot of NWA is good, too. Um, that's, those are like the things that I still listen to today. That kind of give away my age, right? <laughs> and I listen to a lot of Spanish music. Fania, anything Fania. Anything Fania. I listen to, actually, I listen to that more than hip hop. And I even did back then. It keeps you connected, right, to your uh, community. And then when I found out that Johnny Pacheco was Dominican, woo, that was a highlight. That was one of the highlights of my life, actually, <laughs> since I was little. My first dream was to be a ghostwriter for MCs. I always wanted to be a writer. 
I wanted to, you know, I always like, oh my God, one day I'm gonna write for, you know, Rakim, one day I'm gonna write for Roxanne Shante, one day, you know, those are people from my day. I always wanted to be a ghostwriter, and then that just turned into something else, and that turned into something else. So I kind of, you know, and then when I told, I remember um, when I, I called my grandmother to tell her that, oh, you know, mama, I sold this book, you know, I'm gonna write this book, and she started laughing. I said, are you laughing at me? And she was like, just laughing. I was like, are you laughing at me? Because she's like, no. She's like, when you were little in Paraiso and you were six years old, when you were angry at us, you would pull on our hems and say, one day I'm going to write a book about this family and set the record straight. And she says, look at you. You're writing them. You're, you know, you're, you're living your destiny. But, and she goes, and by the way, I don't give a shit what you say about me. <laughs> I am who I am. And that was it. So I can't imagine life any other way. I majored unofficially in college on managing, uh, managing people. Um, basically, uh, it was quite a learning experience. I have a degree in film and, me in film and media studies, but my degree didn't do anything for me. Um, actually working and becoming you know, vested in the community is what led to the opportunities that I've had in my career. I've been very ambivalent when it comes to, um, to education only because I, as an adult, I learned how miseducated I was about my history. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I would say right. <laughs> Just right. That's, that's what I did. I never, I used to not listen in school, you know, especially in religion class when I had to go to the, those Catholic schools and, you know, and I was, as, as the monk or the nun or whatever was telling me how the God-loving missionaries came from Europe to just give God to everybody. And on the way to doing that, enslave indigenous people and then Africans, while they were talking about that BS, I would be writing poetry and writing rhymes and, you know, fantasizing about myself, you know, battling KRS-One or something, you know, like, so I wasn't, I, I, you know, so I would just say write. You have to write, 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 write and read. I don't do hip hop. <laughs> At least not when I'm outside of the bathroom. It's only hip hop in the shower. <laughs> Is your question what being involved in the culture has it changed from the inside? Has it changed my view on it? No, not necessarily. I mean, I just really, you know, when I see the people that the fans or people that you know really love the music, who they look up to. I've become even more vested in doing the work of getting to know myself and doing the internal work because it's interesting how people ascribe this um, um, title of being you know, leaders and leaders of our generation. Leaders, when people that are being ascribed those, like rappers today, are really not leaders. They're just people that we put in that position. They're good rappers. And um, I feel like, especially with young people, you have to kind of see the leader in yourself. You're not a leader just because you're like selling millions of albums, you have a lot of money, you're throwing it around. That's actually, you know, kind of socially irresponsible. But that's their right to be that way. So, I mean, it's kind of made it real, a little bit realer, being, watching from the inside how, you know, things work. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I try not to pass judgment on this generation of hip hop um, because even when I was growing up, my parents were like, oh, you guys are terrible, you know, you should be shot, the graffiti writers suck, it's not art. You know, when you find in, the, in caves in Europe, you know, petroglyphs and graffiti, it's art and it's, you know, the, the most primitive form of expressive art and all this and it's celebrated. But when people are doing what's in their, in their memories, in their, in their ancestral memory, and they're getting up, which is what we called, you know, writing graffiti back in the day, um, all of a sudden you're a vandal. So, you know, I try not to pass judgment because it's easy on my side to see what, got, what people are lacking. I just try to encourage and like be there if anybody ever, you know, like my daughter is into hip hop. If she wants to ever discuss lyrics or something, I'm there to talk to her, but not to kind of chastise, chastise her. A top five what? Top five MCs, um, Rakim, Nas, Rakim, just five, KRS-One, 
Did I say Nas? I would say, yeah, definitely Nas. I mean, that guy is timeless. Uh, Q-Tip. Um, and, um, you know, I would say MC Light. In the context of when she was out and she had to, like, you know, be the, one of the only women in that world and just her delivery, her flow, what she was saying, she was ill. Well, I would say if you're a young rapper, I would say to be diverse in your topics because it gets really boring to hear, you know, one song after the other after the other about bitches and all that. And over and over and over and over and again, it gets very boring. So I would say be, be um, you know, be diverse and, and understand that, you know, what you say is going to affect people all around the world. Hip hop culture has been our most resonant. This thing that people were dissing when I was a kid, right? And my father and everybody was like, that is bull, bull crap. It's whack. It's, a, it's become the th way that young people all over the world express themselves. You can go anywhere in the world. You can go to a, like a, a, a farm in like North Africa and you'll find some shepherd, some kid like rapping and dancing and you know so it's it's the most cultural resonant export and i think a lot of mcs and people in the community don't really see their power so just know that you know if you're going to try to go in that direction that what you say is very weighty so think about that when you write hmm? so, yes okay i would say today because that could change right I would say my favorite place is, um, has been the Sahara Desert in Morocco. Because um, when, I, when we did my father's you know, DNA, his Y DNA came from that region. And it was either um, Amazigh, which is like another way, the correct way of saying Berber, or um, Arabic from that region. And it makes sense because Morocco and Spain were you know, one at one point. And um, when I, I remember going there and right before sunset, putting my hands in the, in like in the sand and saying, my God, at some point, somebody crossed this, crossed this stretch of land in order for me to be where I'm at today. And I felt very one with, the, with what was going on around me. And that was also saddened because it's so hard to get to that place. I wish more people could see it. So I would say that was the most beautiful place I've been to um, so far. Yes. A chance to do what? Oh, I was very, I was, I was friends with Biggie, actually. Um, I remember when he first, I met him through uh, very close friends of his, a journalist. Um, yeah, like that one. Yeah, and um, through him once at a Sony, at a barbecue that Sony was having, was hosting one year, I met Tupac. Um, I don't, I didn't, I don't know if I, I don't remember sitting down and having like eating, you know, ribs with big, I'm sorry, I don't eat pork. I'm just, I'm making a joke. Um, but, um, you know, I've gotten to know some of those guys over the years. I've been, you know, blessed to have, you know, seen, I loved his music, but he asked me my favorite, my top five favorite. And we're spanning like what now hip hop with four generations. I would say one of my, my favorite new MC Newish MC, I would say, was Kendrick Lamar. Because I never haven't given the West Coast the love that it deserves. <laughs> um, because I like Kendrick Lamar, what he's saying. I like his story better. The diversity in what he's in his lyrics better. He just asked me that. Eh, it's all right. Yes, sir. What kind of questions do I ask when I interview people? Oh, you know, that's a good question. I didn't ask her very many questions. I just sat and listened. Um, and it was interesting because when I went to interview her for the second part of the book, um, we looked at when I first, my, one of her daughters who was born here in Lawrence um, took me to the house. And I remember her and I just went like this to each other because we didn't recognize each other. And it was so interesting to me as a mom, right, to like seeing somebody who you could easily pass on the street and not recognize and have that, you know, that relationship, that fractured relationship. So I was more um, intrigued than anything else. 
So I just kind of listened and listened and listened and then observed what was going on around me. And then I realized that so many things haven't changed and that I was walking in the right direction. And the direction that I was walking in, I didn't really need to have her next to me, <laughs> unfortunately. Yes. Are you trying, why are you trying to date? Why are you trying, people are trying to date me? He put me one, one foot in the, in, the, in the ground and it's like, a, how are you a teen mom? Um, I was actually, I think, too young to have a kid, but I was happy that she was here, that she came, because she matured me. She turned, she made me, um, she made me a woman. Actually, when I told one of my family members that I was having a baby, she was like, "Oh, finally, I can put your name in my address book and pen," because I was not very settled. So I, I, I'm just going to tell you, I was young. I'm not going to tell you how old I was. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yes. Why do I have to mention Jay-Z? Is he Dominican? <laughs> what does he have to do with the conversation? Yeah, because you, you asked me, the question was, who are my favorite five? Not my favorite six or my favorite seven. <laughs> He's not on my top five. Top ten, maybe, yes. Yes. I think I saw somebody there. I kind of like Drake. I hate to admit it, especially on camera, but <laughs> what? I didn't hear you. He's not the new Tupac of today. <laughs> no, 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 no. He's the new Drake of today. Drake is Drake. Tupac is Tupac. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great question. What was it like? It was very, what, his question was, what was it like to find out where we came from? Um, I felt very empowered. I, like, I felt like, you know, being from my community, from our community, I believe in spiritual guides, you know, guia espirituales, and that we walk with our guides, and that, you know, I believe in that spirituality. And I remember always having dreams about, you know, these guides protecting me. I, I don't know, I always had that relationship, right, with the, with the, other, the other world, right? And... Um, when I found out the results, it's almost as if those people presented themselves physically in front of me. So for me, it was a way where science and mysticism or science and mythology worked well to make me feel as a, like a complete person. It was really, really, really amazing. And I've been trying to um, go to different parts of the world where I hail from in order to just kind of experience that and see if there's any kind of memory there. Yes. Oh, hi. Good. How are you? Some of, some of both. Um, because if you just let your intuition guide you, then you won't get anything done, right? You'd just be walking around like, hoo, hoo, hoo. Um, so my, but my intuition helps me make, you know, the decisions and what projects I'm going to take on. Because sometimes, you know, I, I choose very difficult um, roads, um, you know, and very difficult subjects to tackle, and that takes a longer time. And sometimes, you know, taking the, but you have to go with your intuition. My intuition tells me always take the road that's less traveled. What am I working on? I'm working on a documentary right now about Latina American teens. And basically, I'm following a group of young women from a suicide prevention program in the Bronx where um, we, in New York City, we have the highest rate of suicide um, ideation and, um, and um, attempts in the whole country. Um, and I'm following a group of them on a, um, basically I'm following, following their lives and through an ancestral DNA project where we found out where their original, you know, where their first mothers came from. And um, with that, they're creating um, these self-portraits that reflect this information. That's only part of the film. It's a lot deeper than that, and um, it's really interesting. And it's good to be able to film something in my own community instead of you know going all the way to um, to West Africa, even though that was cool too. Oh, I wish we had more time. That was my last word. Because <laughs> I feel like you guys are just getting started. Are just getting well, well, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter, and I answer my own stuff and. 
you know, I really look forward to continuing the conversation and hearing your thoughts about um, my book and my work because your thoughts inform what I do next, believe it or not. Yes. Mr. Beta, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.